Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. We will give some more folks a couple minutes to get on, and then we'll get started. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's WWT webinar on application ingress automation with F5 in an OpenShift environment. I'm your host, Maggie Schmidt, on Global Partner Alliance here at WWT. We want to encourage everyone to ask questions today by using the Ask a Question box to the right of the slides. Feel free to submit a question at any time during the presentation, and Tyler will do his best to address all of them following the webinar. And finally, in case there's something you, you miss or you have to drop, Today's session is being recorded, so all registrants will receive a link to the recording in one to two days. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tyler to introduce himself and kick things off. Hey, everybody, and, and thanks, Maggie. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining our webinar today on integrating F5 with OpenShift in a containerized environment. Uh, my name is Tyler Hatton. I'm a technical solutions architect at Worldwide Technology, primarily focused around network automation and application delivery controllers. And thanks again, everybody, for joining the webinar. To provide kind of a high-level agenda of, of what we're going to talk about today, it's really three primary things. And really, the, the first one is around providing really a refresher around OpenShift and Kubernetes, um, talking about the different terms, um, how it works underneath the covers, basically providing that 10,000-foot view of really you know, what is OpenShift, how does it work, so we can kind of even the playing field across everybody watching the webinar today. The second thing that we're going to talk about is really F5 and OpenShift. How can you take these two solutions that exist in really many enterprises today and really integrate them together to improve the overall security and scalability of the applications that you're running in these containerized environments using OpenShift? And then finally, what we're going to do is actually do a demo of this integration between F5 and OpenShift. Show a little bit of how it works, um, what are the different mechanics underneath the covers, and kind of show at a very high level, how do you get this configured within your enterprise so hopefully you can apply it within your own environment. 
before, but before we kind of kick things off, one thing to really call out is there's really kind of a small twist to this webinar today. Um, we, we kind of have an interactive component. So everything that I do in the demo environment is actually within our WWT platform. And what's really cool is with this webinar, what you can do is basically go to this site, register an account, and you can launch an on-demand lab that coincides with the demo that I'm going to show. So everything that I show in the demo, all the configurations that I make, you can do the exact same thing in your own on-demand environment instantiated on our website. So take a look at this website, www.com. We'll talk a little bit later about how you can get direct access to the lab, but register an account for right now, and you get access to this lab that we're going to do a demo around a little bit later today. So to kind of kick things off, really where we wanted to start is just kind of a refresher, again, around what, what is OpenShift at the end of the day. And, you know, OpenShift is really many different things. Uh, but at its core, what OpenShift is, it's a container orchestration platform really built on top of Kubernetes, built for the enterprise. But really, what, is, what does that mean? For the folks who are, who are kind of familiar with Kubernetes, when you install native Kubernetes, it's kind of a complex process. Um, it's not very kind of user-friendly. There's a lot of decisions that you have to make, especially if you're looking to expose that Kubernetes environment to kind of an enterprise space. Um, there's a lot of questions around security hardening. You know, how do we set up networking with this in the, within this environment? And what OpenShift really gives you is kind of an, an out-of-the-box Kubernetes environment that has been security hardened, it's been vetted to run an enterprise environment, and provide some core tools that really make the process of migrating applications from outside of your OpenShift environment or outside of your Kubernetes environment to these different containerized environments that exist within OpenShift specifically. And when we talk about Kubernetes today, in, in OpenShift, there's really two key terms that you should know. Um, the, the first one is basically a node. And when we talk about nodes within OpenShift, and the same thing applies to Kubernetes, there's very similar terms between Kubernetes and OpenShift with some small differences, which I'll make sure to bring up during this presentation. But when you talk about nodes during OpenShift, really this is the underlying compute that supports your cluster. So this could be a, a virtual machine, it could be bare metal hardware, um, whatever's supplying that compute for that cluster, that's going to represent the nodes within, within the OpenShift environment. And then the second important term to know is basically a pod. And what a pod gives you is, is really that environment where your container is going to run. Um, a pod is basically one or more closely related containers deployed to a single host. In many cases, really a pod is just a single containerized application, but a pod in, it is basically going to represent the different microservices that you're going to run within your Kubernetes environment that are going to communicate with each other and work together to make a single application. So whenever we say containers or whenever we say, um, you know, pods or microservices, all those are really the same thing um, at a very high level. So just kind of keep that in mind. And the way that all this comes together is basically your pods or your containers are going to run on top of these nodes. And the job that, that Kubernetes and the job that OpenShift performs within this environment is it's basically going to schedule these, these jobs or these pods, these compute workloads across the different nodes that are part of your cluster. And then as part of that, they share a, a network, or in the case of OpenShift, a software-defined network. And what this ultimately gives you is within OpenShift is any, any pod or any application or microservice that you host within OpenShift is completely closed off from the outside world. Basically, nothing can get in unless you directly expose it to the outside world. So it makes it an incredibly secure environment natively but you have to kind of think about, well, how do I get external client traffic to that environment, into that shared network that is shared across the different pods within, within this 
cluster. And that's where something like a, a router really comes into play. So the, the way to think of a router within, within OpenShift and in, in Kubernetes it's called an ingress, is really it serves as the front door into your, your cluster that hosts these different containers. It, it serves as a means of an external client to basically access the different applications that are going to be deployed to this OpenShift cluster. And the way that it does that is basically through a system of routes. So in the case of OpenShift, it routes traffic to different applications will be through this route system where each route will represent basically a host name. So in this case, if you look here, it says shop.apps.wwt.com. That will map to a route. And your client will basically send that as part of a web request to your router. And based on that host name header that's being sent as part of the HTTP request, the router will know which pod or which service to point your, your request or point to that, that client's request to as part of this cluster. So in this case, maybe it will point to that top node at the very top. But what happens if something goes wrong and maybe that node goes down? Well, the router is smart enough to know to point to maybe the, the, the next node available that has available services that, that host the application that that route is pointed to. And that's basically that that router is going to do as part of that. Is it also basically manages the, the state or it looks at, you know, of the different available pods or replicas of the pod that are available for this application, where should I point this traffic to? Basically act, acting as a load balancer as part of this configuration. So if you think about that, you know, we just use the term load balancer. And for most enterprise environments today, that's usually the role that an F5 device plays. In the case of a router in an OpenShift environment, it's usually an HA proxy that serves as that router. But how do you make that an F5 device? And that's where container ingress services come into play. And what container ingress services is, or CIS for short, is it basically allows you to create a direct integration between your OpenShift cluster, your container orchestration platform, and your F5 device. And ultimately what that gives you the ability to do is the F5 device can basically look into your OpenShift environment, see the state of the applications that are running there, see what's online and offline, and then freely distribute traffic based on what's available. But why would you want to do, why would you want to use F5 in this case? And the big, the, one of the big reasons is really around security. So as you migrate applications, maybe external from your OpenShift environment into OpenShift, there might be, you know, security requirements that are brought with that application. So things such as WAF policies, access control policies, maybe you want bot detection, or anti-fraud detection is part of implementing your application into the OpenShift environment. Or maybe you want to standardize on where your SSL decryption is occurring or, or your TLS termination. What the F5 device really gives you is as you migrate your applications from outside of your OpenShift environment into it, into that containerized solution, it gives you the ability to really standardize in, in your policies that are being applied. where from a dependency standpoint, nothing about the, the policies that are being applied to the application change. So as you go from outside of, of OpenShift, inside of OpenShift, when you're migrating the application, the WAF policy stays the same. The way that you're doing TLS termination stays the same. And F5 basically acts as that, that single means of really applying those policies, applying those, those security dependencies to your application as they're being migrated to OpenShift. And the second reason really to look at, 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 at container ingress services is really around simplified deployments. So 
if we think about what it means to deploy an F5 configuration today in conjunction with deploying an application, usually it's, it's a fairly drawn out process for, for most organizations today where, you know, as part of deploying the application, I might have to send a ticket over to the, the F5 guy. I might have to wait, you know, best case scenario, a couple days, potentially a couple weeks. And there, there's really a kind of a bottleneck as part of that process. And something that really container ingress services gives you is because of that tight integration between F5 and OpenShift, the deploying F5 configuration is basically the same way that you would deploy an application into OpenShift using a series of manifests that you see near the top. So as we'll show in the demo a little bit later, the way that you deploy applications or way that a developer would traditionally deploy a new containerized application into OpenShift is through a manifest. And when you use container ingress services, the same thing applies to F5 configurations. You're going to use the same manifest system to deploy that F5 configuration, making it really uniform across all the dependencies and all the configurations necessary to bring that application online. And ultimately what that means is you're, you're really creating flow. So if you think about really the three ways of DevOps, you're increasing flow in what it means to deploy an F5 configuration to bring that application online. No longer are you waiting for really an, an F5 guide to build your configuration. It's just another manifest that's going to basically add on to that application configuration that's going to be deployed into the environment. And that can also be version controlled. So really, if you think about these manifests, they're really just a form of infrastructure as code where the state of the application, its dependencies, whether that's storage, load balancing, networking, all those dependencies will be contained within that manifest, and they will all be deployed at the same time, basically simplifying, again, that, that deployment process. So how does it work? How does container ingress services work, and what are the different components? And the first component of CIS is really the, the VXLAN tunnel. And if you look at the OpenShift cluster and where a big IP device typically sit within a network, they're really two isolated units within that network, or two isolated hosts or groups of hosts. And what the VXLAN tunnel really gives you is the ability for that big IP device to communicate into that closed off network or software defined network that exists within the OpenShift cluster. It gives the F5 device a way of really looking into the, the OpenShift cluster and seeing the individual microservices or pods that are running in there and looking at the health of those pods so it can successfully load balance traffic and most efficiently send traffic to those pods. The second component that's required is this thing known as a big IP controller. And really what the big IP controller is, is and this is specific to container ingress services, but what the big IP controller does is it serves as a means of monitoring your OpenShift environment. So as pods get spun up and spun down on these, these different hosts that exist within the cluster, what the big IP controller is going to do is basically watch for that and update the configurations on your big IP device. So let's say, for example, earlier we had mentioned, you know, what happens if, you know, for example, as part of this two node cluster, one of the nodes goes down. What the big IP controller will do is it will see that one of those nodes has gone down and update the, the pool that exists on the big IP device in real time to reflect that change that happened within the cluster. Or let's say, for example, you know, maybe I'm scaling out. Maybe I'm spinning up multiple replicas of my pod. So instead of you know, one or two, maybe I want to run four. The big IP controller will basically update the configuration to, to basically reference that change. And that's really what the big IP controller really serves as is it's a pod that runs within the OpenShift cluster next to really the other pods that exist in there 
and just monitors the state of the environment and makes changes to your big IP device as changes occur. So that being said, how does the big IP controller know which pod should be load balanced within your OpenShift cluster? How does it know, you know, what are the WAF policies that should apply, um, which SSL certificate it should use? Really the different components that are going to make up that, that VIP on your F5 device is going to load balance traffic against the cluster. And that's the, the, really the third component, which is the config. And native object that exists within Kubernetes and OpenShift that basically provide a configuration that's going to be inserted into one of your pods. So in this case, this config map is going to be a configuration that's going to be applied and inserted into our big IP controller. And in this case, what our config map is going to give us is the instructions that are that are Big IP controller is going to use to configure the VIP on your on our Big IP device. So things such as you know what load balancing method I should use or what WAF policy or SSL certificate I should use. It really provides those individual instructions that the the controller is going to use to configure the Big IP device and tell it what to do. So let's take a demo. Let's take a look at a demo of this. What does this look like when it's applied into a real environment? And what we're going to do is in a second, I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to look at this lab environment that's, again, available through our WWT.com site. And what we're going to walk through is really the configuration process of setting up those three different components, setting up the VX lane tunnel to get connectivity between the big IP and OpenShift, the deployment of the big IP controller, so that, that pod that basically monitors the state of our OpenShift cluster and performs configurations on the big IP device. And then finally, we'll go through the actual deployment of the, the, uh, the config map that defines the configurations that are going to be applied to our big IP device. So if I shoot right over, there we go. So as the diagram showed, the way that our environment is set up today is we have several different things set up here. So we have a, a big IPVE, which is basically going to be our, our front door into our OpenShift environment. We're going to load balance traffic from our VE to the different applications that exist within our OpenShift cluster. And then we have this OpenShift cluster at the bottom, which is hosting several different microservices within it. But in this case, what we have deployed inside of it is an application called Book Info, which is a basic demo application that can be deployed to any Kubernetes environment. And what we're going to do is basically set up a VIP that sends traffic using this VXLAN tunnel to this pod called the product page pod. And this is going to be a, a microservice that will basically serve as the GUI front end of this Book Info application. So if we look at our environment, we have several different components. We have our OpenShift console right here that shows the different applications deployed. So here's our product page application, our microservice. We have our big IP device. So I'm going to log into this real quick. And if I take a look at the configurations, this is a completely blank device. So there's, there's no configurations on here, which serves as a great demo environment as I create these configurations in real time. And then we have an Ansible Tower server. And what we're going to do is basically use the Ansible Tower server as a means of automating the initial configurations on our OpenShift cluster and our big IP device. So I'm going to log into here. And we're going to use a playbook within Ansible to do this. So I'll go to templates. And we have this one called CIS Setup. And what this is going to do is it's going to pull down a, a playbook behind the scenes that is going to go through the initial steps of configuring the OpenShift cluster and that big IP device. So if you look right here, 
it's going to create a partition. It's going to create the tunnel um, on the big IP device. It's going to create the self IP within tunnel, install AS3. But it's going to go through all these dependencies in an automated fashion, where then we get some type of result. And the big thing to really call out is everything within this playbook we're going to provide at the end of the presentation. So this is kind of the code that's being used behind the scenes. But this, what this playbook really gives us is a mechanism of really streamlining this process and making the, the, the means of, of deploying this CIS um, setup or architecture a lot faster for us so I don't have to do it manually right here. So we have the CIS components deployed. Um, we, have our, we have our controller deployed, and we can, we can check that real quick by doing So looks like we're good. And then the next step that we're going to do is basically deploy the actual config map as part of this configuration. So I'm going to open up Visual Studio Code right here. And what we have opened up on the side is the manifests that make up our book info application. And whenever you deploy something into an OpenShift or Kubernetes environment, the way that you do that is really through a series of manifests. So for example, for our product page microservice that we have deployed, the way that that's being deployed is through this product page.yaml file. And basically what this manifest provides is really the specifications for how this containerized application is going to run in our OpenShift environment. So things such as what image should we use um, for this application or what container image should we use, what uh, service account should we use. Um, all that's really specified in this YAML file and hopefully is you know, version controlled in some type of source control management system. And then also within the same book info directly, directory, what I created is this config map. And this is going to be the configuration that I'm going to apply to my big IP controller to tell it what configurations it needs to make to my big IP device or to my virtual big IP device within this demo environment. And if we look at this config map, it's really made up of, of a couple different pieces. At the very top, we have this thing that's called kind, which basically, basically tells OpenShift what type of configuration is going to be applied. We have some metadata that define you the name of the configuration, some labels that basically say, what type of configuration do I want to apply? In this case, I want to make a virtual server. And then I have this AS3 true flag right here. And there's multiple different ways that you can basically provide information to that big IP controller to tell it how to control the big IP device. But one of the ways that you can do that is through what's called an AS3 declaration. And for those who are kind of unfamiliar with F5 AS3, what AS3 gives you is basically a, a declarative API for basically creating all the configurations that are associated with an application and storing them into a single payload. So if we look right here, what we see is actually the, the, the contents of the AS3 payload that the big IP controller is going to send to the big IP device. And to the point around this being a single declarative payload that contains all of our configurations, that's really what you're looking at right here. So within this payload, you're going to see things such as virtual addresses, which are going to be the addresses that are going to be used for our virtual IP um, that's going to be configured on the big IP device. The name of our pool, the SSL, name of the SSL uh, profile that we want to apply to the VIP the actual WAF policy, the name of the WAF policy that we want to apply. But again, really what this gives you is a, a, a single payload, a single means of configuring your F5 device where every single aspect of the configuration can be stored in one place in a, in a agreed upon manner. And that's what AS3 is really giving you here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to apply this config map to my cluster. And the way that you do that is you run the OC apply command. And in the case of Kubernetes, it would be kubectl. But what 
I have in the book info direct directory and basically apply it to my cluster. So when we're in OC apply, I'm going to do a dash F and then the name of the manifest file or the path to the manifest file. And I'm going to get a notification basically telling me that this configuration has been created. So what's happening behind the scenes is what OpenShift or what that big IP controller is doing is it just took in this config map and it's going to my big IP device and it's performing the configurations that were specified as part of that AS3 payload. So if I refresh this page, what we'll see is now there are two different configurations or two different virtual IPs that were created. Um, one on this 192.168.2.181 IP, which was defined as part of my declaration if we look right here. And that's running over HTTPS. And then we want have one running over HTTP. And one of the cool things about AS3 is it has some templatization functionality or let's say, for example, I want to create that HTTPS FIP. It knows automatically to create the port 80 or HTTP redirect behind the scenes to, to redirect all HTTP traffic to HTTPS. So if we dig into this a little bit deeper and kind of look at the individual configurations, as we look here, we should have an SSL certificate or SSL profile assigned to it, which we do. We should have a security policy. Would you look at that? We have a security policy applied to it. So it looks like everything was configured successfully. So let's, let's try to hit this application. Let's try to hit this, this IP or, or this book info application and see what the result was. So if I go to this bookinfo.example.com, which points to that IP address, what I should see are really several different things. I can verify first that the SSL certificate was applied, so we get that. I can get to the application, which tells me the VIP is working properly and we're successfully load balancing traffic into our OpenShift environment. And then finally, what I want to do is really test the WAF policy. And the way that I'm going to do that is really send a, a very obvious SQL injection attack where I'm going to try to drop the members table, which is pretty malicious. <clears throat> but when I do that, I get blocked. So it looks like that's working too. So it looks like all the different mechanisms are working properly and everything was successfully configured. It's, it's really part of this overall configuration. We had our VXLAN tunnel that was configured as part of that playbook. And as also part of it, we had the big IP controller deployed. And then we deployed a config map to the big IP controller, which created the F5 VIP that communicated to the product page application that we showed just a second ago. So everything looks like it was successfully working from our standpoint. So to, to kind of go back to the slides and, and really kind of close things out, everything that I just showed you a second ago is again available on our www.com site. Um, you, if you go to Explore Networking Application Delivery Controllers at the top, you'll see a lab called F5 Red Hat OpenShift Lab. If you click the lab or the Launch Lab button on the page, it will give you direct access to that lab environment where you can basically prove out the use case I just showed you in this environment or really any use case that you have around OpenShift or F5 and really integrating those two different solutions using container ingress services. And the other thing that we really created as, as part of this demo is, is a GitHub page. So github.com slash Tyler Hatton slash F5 OpenShift webinar. And within that, the readme of that GitHub page and within that repo, I provided the playbook that I just showed off as part of the demo. So if you're curious about really the individual steps that were performed as part of that Ansible Tower component, you can see that as part of that playbook and you'll actually see how you can potentially apply that same playbook within your own environment. And the second thing that we really applied there was some other relevant labs that we have within our www.com platform. So in addition to the F5 OpenShift lab, we have labs around you know, OpenShift 101 or setting up CI CD pipelines within OpenShift. So if you're just getting started with using OpenShift or Kubernetes, this could potentially be a good place to start. Or maybe you want to figure out, hey, how do I take, you know, these, these manifests are being used to build my application and the dependencies, such as the virtual IP on the F5 device, 
what you can do is use that CICD lab as a means of really proving that out and understanding, you know, how do I build out a CICD pipeline around deploying applications into my OpenShift environment. So that's also an incredibly useful resource. And I would encourage everybody to take a look at this repo and take a look at really the different links that we have in there that point to those different resources. So that being said, Maggie, do you want to kick it over to questions? Yep. Um, first question, Tyler, how long will the lab be available after the webinar? That's a, that's a great question. We get that question a lot. I think today it's five days after you instantiate the lab. Um, it's either three or five days. So when you click that launch button, it will spin up that lab environment, and it should remain in that state for at least a couple days. Um, they don't expire very quickly. I want to say it's five days. Perfect. Second, um, how would you deploy the container ingress service when you are running a clustered F5 environment? That's, a, that's also a really great question. So the, really the, the key difference, and if we, if we look at the environment that I set up within the demo um, lab that I showed a second ago, that was a single node environment, right? And that's not, that doesn't really map well to what you would traditionally run in production. And the way that you would deploy container ingress services within a clustered environment is really there's a, there's a one to one relationship between your the the number of big IP controllers that you're going to run and the number of nodes that you have within the cluster. So every single node that you run in that cluster. So if I'm running an HA pair, for example, with two nodes, I'm going to run two big IP controllers within my OpenShift environment with one. Uh, one controller being dedicated to the primary node and then the other controller being dedicated to maybe the standby node. And then the same thing applies to the VXLAN tunnel. So it's also a one-to-one -one relationship where I'm going to set up a VXLAN tunnel between our uh, primary device in our, in our OpenShift cluster and then another one between our standby device and our OpenShift cluster. So hopefully that, that kind of answered that question. And then we just got another one around the labs again, Tyler, can you relaunch the lab after it goes down after five days? Yeah, no, that's a, that's another great question, and we get that a lot. <laughs> um, it's, I run a lot of workshops, and it's funny to see the, the same questions. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, you can launch the labs as many times as you want. Um, there's a ton of labs on that www.k.com site, um, and you can launch as many as you want whenever you want. So let's say, for example, you launched the lab today, and you know three months from now you wanted to take another look at it. You can absolutely do that. There's no restrictions around the amount of times that you can launch it. Perfect. And then finally, what version of F5 and OpenShift are required slash recommended for this solution? So I, I know in the case of of, so when we're using AS3 in this case, I don't think AS3 is supported until 12.1, um, until you can install that package. In this demo, I think we're running, I can look real quick, I think we're running 13 as the major version. Um, if, if I remember correctly, looking at the documentation, I want to say that it can run on 11, potentially 11.5. Um, not trying to guess at the question, but yeah, I, I, I know for sure it will run on 12.1, which is the dependency for that AS3 package that, that um, you need in order to kind of configure more complex configurations on the device. As for OpenShift, I know for the demo we're running it on 3.11. Um, I don't know what's the minimum requirement. My guess is that's within the, the container ingress services documentation. Um, so F5 has some pretty detailed documentation around the integration that um, is, is freely available that gives you should give you the information you need to identify the minimum versions needed to run this integration. Okay, um, another question, Tyler. Our organization is looking at OpenShift and using F5 for CIS but we don't have the skill set on staff to set it up. Can WWT provide professional services 
set up F5 container ingress services in OpenShift? Yeah, so no, that's a that's a wonderful question. So then have expertise both around F5 and OpenShift where if your organization is struggling to implement that solution within your environment, we can absolutely provide professional services to really help your organization succeed in, in, in building that out. Um, I, I know there's sometimes, especially if you have a more complex network, there, there can be some complexities behind the scenes that might make that more challenging. We can absolutely help with that. Um, that's, some, that's certainly something that we specialize at from our standpoint. Great. Um, how can other proprietary processes like LTM, BIP, and procurement, and SSL certificate procurement be automated? Any best practices around the same question? Can you ask that again, Maggie? I just want to make sure I get all the components of that yeah. question. Um, how can other pr proprietary processes like LTM, BIP, IP, procurement, and SSL certificate procurement be automated? Any best practices? Yeah, that's a that's a wonderful question um, to ask. So, I'll take on the the first part of that question, which is around really SSL certificate procurement. And it's a it's a funny question because I actually had a I had the same conversation um, with an engineer I worked with yesterday. I worked with yesterday, and it, really the, the complexity of that question is is really around. Um, certificate authorities and how you procure certificates from those certificate authorities. Um, usually they differ based on the CA. Um, what we do see commonly is that many larger organizations will look at a solution like Venify, which kind of abstract away the process of procuring those certificates and, and automating that process. Something else that I've seen is um, organizations um, so we, we've done this internally within Worldwide, is we'll look at using something like a Let's Encrypt to quickly generate the certificate. So for the folks who, who aren't familiar with Let's Encrypt, it's, it's basically um, an organization that, that provides a, a process of generating free um, CA signed certificates um, in an in, in automated fashion. And there's a, really a process built around generating those certificates. And what we've seen is really organizations will use um, less encrypt in the, in the automated you know, ACME system that, that's built around it to dynamically generate those certificates in a way that's free. So to kind of directly answer that question, if you're looking for kind of a, a very well documented and free way of doing it, take a look at less encrypt. Um, there's multiple articles online on how you can dynamically generate those certificates for an OpenShift cluster. Um, using an OpenShift environment. And then if you're looking kind of for a more enterprise solution, definitely take a look at Venify. Um, we've seen a lot of organizations use that for dynamically or automating the generation or signing of certificates um, and, and applying those to a big IP device. The other, the other thing around the, the IP address um, so I think the other question was from saying IP addresses for your LTM device. There's really multiple different ways that you could do that. Um, one way that you could do that is really around making IP provisioning as part of your initial build process for when you generate the, the manifest or the config map that's going to be applied to create the VIP. So um, one way you could do it is um, is, is part of getting an IP address, you could um, basically, as part of your CIC process, get the IP address and then insert that IP address in the config map dynamically using like a Jinja template, for example. Another way that we've been looking at doing IP, or at least I've been looking at doing IP reservation is for using um, open Kubernetes in addition to having a config map or a manifest that dictates the configuration for your big IP device. Why not have a one for one that calls an operator that configures your, you know, your IP reservation or your IPM system, like an info blocks, for example. Um, that's another way that you could potentially do it. 
There's also, the third option is there's actually a IPAM controller um, component of Container Ingress Services that F5 has built that integrates directly with InfoBlox. So if you run InfoBlox, that's a potential solution where as you create your, your config maps or your VIPs um, using Container Ingress Services, it'll actually reach out to InfoBlox and reserve that IP address. I haven't tested that out, um, so I don't know how well it works, but that's kind of the third solution that you have in addition to, um, you know, operators are building that as part of your CICD build process. All right, thanks, Tyler. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time, so we're gonna wrap things up here. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. As a reminder, if you want free on-demand access to this lab and many others, please visit www.com. Have a good day. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks, everybody.